This session um, is to provide an overview on the data lifecycle and give pointers on good data management practices, as well as provide some information on the RDM support that is available at the university. And it is very much an introduction, partially because it covers the breadth of disciplines studied here at Alba. So that includes life sciences, technology, business, arts, and design, meaning that the, the data being worked on varies greatly um, depending on instruments, practices, considerations associated with the research. So whilst this session won't go into um, discipline specific questions, um, such as scientific computing or the details of handling personal data, we do have uh, more advanced sessions available on those themes this autumn. And those are also available to you, to everyone outside of ARP as well. So do have a look on the ARP RDM website. And uh, we have one participant who mentioned working with tidy uh, data. I'm afraid we won't be able to go into uh, details of arranging or cleaning data in this session, but we are already considering if that could be something that we might add in the spring uh, spring session program. Right. So um, though we are covering the very basics here. I hope the issues and questions that we raise are ones that you could all consider from your own disciplinary contexts and um, wonder if they apply to your work, if they could support your research and help structure it and make it more efficient. Of course, you are the experts within your fields and you know your data the best. So I'll start with a very quick round of introductions from our side. I think there will be, there's a hundred of us, so I'll keep it quite short. Um, my name is Essie Vithanen. I'm the, uh, one of the senior advisors at the Alba of Research Services. My own research background is in film research and design, uh, working on both archival data as well as the visual data arising from design processes. And with me here today, I have two colleagues from the research services uh, with rather different disciplinary backgrounds. I have uh, Lucy Heretica, who is an information specialist with a background in information studies. Um, and she's worked at the CERN library and, uh, and uh, CSSS with the, the Fair Data Services. And then there's Kathy Laksa, Messi there, um, who is the ALBA data advisor, and her background is in geology and crystallographic data. So this presentation uh, will be recorded and made available on the ALBA website. So we would ask you to keep your mics off during the presentation, and we should have time um, at the end to, for discussions and questions. But if you do find yourself having a very pressing question during the presentation, Lucy and Gabi will be hosting uh, a Presimo for the questions, uh, that I think they'll put the link in the chat where you'll be able to ask any pressing, pressing questions that you might have. And the presentation slides have quite a lot of links and resources. Uh, so these will be made available after, afterwards as well to have um, access to those links. And I think we are ready to start recording, I think. Yes, the recording has already started actually. There we go. <laughs> so please go ahead. Lovely. So a brief outline of what we will cover today. Uh, as I said, very basics. Uh, what is research data? Uh, what does managing it entail? And why it is beneficial? We go through a bit of the, the funder and publication or publisher uh, requirements that are posed on research data management. And then we talk through the life cycle of data and questions to consider at various points along the way. And lastly, we look at some of the services available here at ALBA to help manage those, that research data. And as we'll know from the, the, the wealth of disciplinary backgrounds here today, um, research data looks very different in very various fields. And it requires sort of what does research data look like in your field? Uh, what type of data do you, do you expect to come out of projects? Um, it might be interview or survey data, text documents, photographs, films even, uh, drawings. It might be instrument-specific measurement data or sensor data, codes, algorithms, and software, our models and, and production processes. So, of course, it is very um, specific to your discipline and to your particular research. But in essence, uh, research data is any information that has been collected, observed, generated or created to validate your research findings. So this includes data that emerges from your own research or experiments, as well as any pre-existing data that you use or reuse in your projects and of course credit accordingly. 
whilst then the data research management or RDM refers to the organization, storage, sharing and preservation of that research data. And this is field dependent, so it depends on how the data will be generated and what analyzing methods will be used, uh, what instruments you might be using for that. And I expect that RDM is something that you're all already doing. And the, this session would hope to give some pointers on how to be smart and mindful about it and maybe um, save you some hassle further along in your research projects. So the motivation for all of this, um, the, the why though, why this matters, is in a nutshell that it makes your research more efficient and saves you time. It's a matter of taking time at the beginning of the project to decide on how you'll handle your data to avoid hours of uh, scrambling around later on in the projects, looking for things, wondering where that one file was, and uh, rearranging your data in order to share it, for example. There are also questions regarding research ethics and legal issues that are much simpler to solve before um, in the planning stages before you've started gathering your data than sort of halfway through the project. Very importantly for those who are working in teams, it helps you and your colleagues find and communicate about your data. So sometimes when you collaborate to get new team members who need to be introduced to data, uh, one person might leave halfway through or, or during a project and someone might need to step in to continue that work. Um, if someone was, there's a horrifying thought of someone who was handed your project files right now, would they have an idea of what you were doing? Would they know what the data is, what the results were, what parts of the data had already been processed and whatnot? So those kind of questions to um, suppose motivate you for, to, uh, to do RDM. And it improves transparency and reproducibility of research results, which means that if you choose to open your data, other researchers can run your tests, they can verify your results. And similarly, um, it gives you as researchers insight into your colleagues' work that journal articles alone uh, would struggle to provide. So it improves the openness in science. And it enables the reusing, sharing and opening of data. Um, data that is organized, named and generally in order can be shared in open file repositories and you can upload your data online and then have others reuse it. And what's almost more exciting, uh, you can access the data of others as well. And um, yes, and even more these days, um, RDM is a necessary skill, not only if you're working at university, but for, for most uh, research organizations, companies, it is becoming um, a basic skill in, in industry as well. And then the requirements for open data are increasing from the side of funders and, and publishers as well. So most funders foster open data and good data management practices. And there is a general push both in Finland nationally, on EU level and globally towards open data. And one way of doing this is for funders to require a data management plan. So researchers are now requiring, um, or funders are requiring researchers to make informed decisions about how they, they treat their data. And it is recommended that uh, you open the data always when possible. Of course, there are cases where you can't do that. Uh, for example, if there are trade secrets or personal or sensitive nature of the data. However, if you can't open your data, it is recommended that you at least open the metadata. So give some descriptive information about the data if you're not able to open the data sets themselves. So in addition to funders, also some journals are demanding open data, um, mostly the sciences. And this is a part of the, the opening the discussion about research methodology. Uh, for example, the, and the funder side of things, um, the Academy of Finland at EU Horizon require data management plans and they, to illustrate that you can manage your data. So be prepared to publish your data, even if there's no, um, especially if there's no justified reason to keep it closed. And for meeting these requirements, um, you'll be quite well off if you follow the ALBA Open Science and Research Policy and the RDM guidelines. There are links there on those and they're both open to, to those outside of ALBA as well. So what does all of this uh, mean in practice and how it is done? So this will vary um, depending on your project and how the data has been generated, uh, what analyzing methods you're using or instruments and software employed. But generally, it's an awareness of the life cycle of the data at various stages of the research. And here's an outline of the, the stages from start to finish. 
from planning to considering the ethics and legal issues, organizing and documenting your data, storing and sharing it, publishing it, and finally reporting and archiving it. And you'll note a dashed line for going from reporting and archiving back to planning, which denotes that research data can be a cycle where the data is reused and reanalyzed. So starting from the very beginning of the process, um, you might have an idea or perhaps some expectations of what type of material you're gathering. Um, you might be wondering where to save your files, thinking about if Dropbox is safe for file sharing or if you should use your institutional servers, um, what you need to do if you're doing interview data, um, wondering about the uh, GDPR and EU requ law requirements regarding um, if you're working with uh, personal data or where you're allowed to store personal details or contact details or best, how to best organize your lab experiments. So sort of as a way to answer some of these questions or most of them is the DMP. So to help arrange all of this is why we have the data management plans. And essentially, it answers what kind of data you'll generate and how you plan, and plan to manage it. And as I mentioned earlier, this is something that many funders require. And even if you don't have a, a funder requiring this from you, I would recommend um, writing one anyway at the beginning of the project. And a DMP should be written before you start gathering your data. And one thing to note is that it's a plan. So it's a living document. It's reviewed and updated as you go along. Um, as we all know, research plans rarely go according to our best laid uh, plans, so uh, DMPs are not set in stone. You update those as you go along and as you find out more about your research data and, and learn more throughout the process. And a DMP would clarify some points straight from the start, uh, questions about ownership, um, some legal requirements, and it avoids some sinkholes along the way. And regarding this, it's especially something to pay attention to if you are working on um, sensitive or, or personal data. So are you using data from other sources? And also, do you think your work might lead to inventions or patents? Um, do you think you'll be sharing your data with others? Um, for example, if you're gathering interview data and you might want to share it with another university or institution or research organization, you would need permission from the interviewees. And this is something that's a lot easier to ask for at the beginning of the project when you're getting consent in the first place. So just, again, planning ahead to make your life a bit easier in the long run. And the why to write a DMP is that it helps you to be systematic about managing your, your data and it saves you time. And if you do have a, a funder that requires a DMP, I would recommend checking their guidelines in advance and making sure that you have the most up-to-date versions. Those questionnaires um, sometimes change over time. So make sure that you've got to up-to-date information. And things you should um, answer in your DMP are the very essentials. What is your data about? What is the general subject or range of scope? How will you generate or obtain your data? Uh, how will you process it or analyze it? And how will you describe your data? What method will you use for this? Will you have a readme file, a code book of some sort? So how will you describe and organize your data? And what are the ethical and legal aspects you should consider and how will you take them into account? How will you plan for those? And how will you store and share your data? And are you going to open your data? And if you plan to do so, how will you do it? Where, when? And if you don't open your data, what are the reasons? And very importantly, this is a lot to know at the beginning of a project. So again, to emphasize the fact that the DMP is a living document, which you update as you go along and find out more about your particular project. And there are some resources available to help you with this. Uh, there are data management planning tools. Um, some might be familiar with the DMP Bully. This is a Finnish one. Uh, it's a free online tool and database for data management plans. You'll find examples of, of DMPs it also has templates for that the funders require. For example, the Finnish Academy templates, you can find it there. It is quite a useful place to go into. Just have a snoop around and read a few DMPs made by other researchers just to get a feel for, for the whole thing. And then if you want to go into a bit, bit more advanced tools, there's the um, Data Steward Wizard. 
uh, which is a bank of questions around research data management, which you can kind of click through. They're quite short questions, but it guides you through some issues to, to consider. And then um, at the end, you can export your answers into a template. You have some funder templates there, uh, EU funders. Then there's the DMP online uh, by the Data Curation Center and Argos by Open Air. So these are free tools that you're able to go in and, and have a look around. And then the um, Alto DMP guidelines um, will help you guide through the process and the benefits as well. And if you are an Alto researcher, we also have a review service. So if you do need to submit a, a DMP to a funder, um, you can send it for a pre-check to the research data at alto.fi, email address for a review, which means that um, someone from the research services will give some notes on it, um, maybe help you refine the plan if needed. And then when you have an idea of what kind of data you'll be working with, it's also time to consider the ethical and legal requirements of your data. So what kind of data will you be collecting? Um, will you be handling personal data? Are you collecting this? Does it need to be anonymized? These sort of questions. When will you do it? How? Um, yeah. So there are special data types you need to be very mindful of if you're working with. Uh, these include personal data. That includes information that identifies a person directly or indirectly also. That includes names, uh, an ID number, location data, IP address, um, one or more factors specific to a physical, psychological, genetic, cultural, or social identity of a natural person. And also keep in mind that whilst a single identifying factor might not be used to pinpoint an individual, um, it doesn't take many factors um, when used together that can, be, uh, that can be used to identify a person. Then if you're working with sensitive data, that would be data consisting of racial or ethnic origin, uh, political opinions, religious uh, philosophical beliefs, trade union membership, genetic data, biometric data, data concerning health, or data concerning a person's sex life or sexual orientation. These are also specific categories that need to be aware of. And also you might be working with confidential data. So that might be coming from a company. It might include trade secrets or things that might be of commercial interest. So these need to be taken into consideration to protect the rights of research participants and to respect the ownership of the data. So then if you are working, or find yourself working with these data types, here are some things to consider at various stages of the process. So before you start collecting the data, plan the life cycle of personal data handling in particular. If you will be collecting sensitive personal data, um, at Aldo we try to get an ethical pre-review. Um, the pre-review is to, uh, quite useful to spot any potential problems and help you prepare for those and advice uh, on when this is applicable, you can find out the Aldo website. And I would also emphasize that the ethical pre-review at Aldo is something that you need to do before you start gathering the data. So this is why um, planning ahead and taking time at the DMP stage makes sense because it's not something that you can go back to. And also clarifying the procedures you should use to inform research subjects about their rights. And whilst you get to collecting and storing and sharing data, uh, be sure to use secure online data collection methods and um, use storing and sharing services that suit personal data and enable secure data sharing. And importantly, share, define who has the access um, to the data. If you're working with other institutions, are we allowed to share the data? Do you have consent from the participants? These sort of questions. And then if you'll be publishing your work, um, check that you can publish this data. Prepare your data for publishing. That might be anonymizing or pseudonymizing methods. Pseudonymization would mean that the data can be traced back to the individual, whereas anonymization means that there is no way to trace that data back to the individual. And that is um, actually really quite difficult to do. We have quite a good session on handling, um, anonymizing and handling personal data at the Alta RDM training sessions. I recommend that for if you're working on this topic. And define access to access rights in the repository that suit your data. And if you can't publish the data, you might um, maybe publish the description of your data. So there's a lot to consider here. And it can be daunting, uh, certainly is complex. And this is often when researchers need additional support from research services. 
And here is some guidance on the ethical and legal issues. Um, we have the other guidelines uh, for handling personal data uh, for informing research participants, and also the general guide on personal data and ethics. Um, then in the research services, if you're based at ALGA, there are um, that um, research data at ALGA.fi uh, email address that you can reach research services on, where they, we have people who are experts in anonymizing data on, and lawyers available to help with um, help advise on contractual things, working with companies or confidential data. But there's also a lot of um, other resources that are very good. And that includes the Finnish Social Science Data Archive. They have very good guidelines available, uh, both for DMPs and dealing with personal sensitive data. There's also um, guidance available for the GDPR, so EU's General Data Protection Regulation. Um, that this is what it was about, and it affects the how personal data can be stored and shared. And then we have the All European Academies uh, Code of Conduct for Research Integrity, and then think um, the Finnish National Board of Research Integrity. They have there are links to their Responsible Code of Conduct for Research and Ethical Principles for Research human participants and ethical review. And as you can imagine, often these are very case sensitive and they're specific to your research project. So in, if there are any kind of doubt, it is worth reaching out to the research services at your institutions to prepare for these. And then, then you actually get to the research side. So then you start gathering up your data. It might be the measurement data, images, audio files, um, calculations, and so forth. So when those files start piling up and um, start getting names like Monday test uh, spreadsheet updated, the need to organize that data arises. The questions um, of, of organizing and, and documenting your data when you're thinking about naming your files, putting them in folders, sorting them out, um, there are a few Good questions to, to get me guide that, guide through that. And first would be, will you under, understand your data in five years time? And not even five years, but now if you give the, your files to your group leader or colleague, will they understand what, what you're doing or what your data is about? And will someone be able to pick up a project and continue your research in the future based on your data and your documentation or metadata? Um, so as a side note also that in some field, peer reviewers, uh, if you're publishing an article, might request uh, to see unopened data. So it makes sense to, to have it organized straight from the start. So we'll try to, you try to ensure that you and others can find, use, and properly cite your data by naming and organizing it wisely and describing it as well as possible. So good documentation, it decreases the risk of false interpretation of the data and well-organized, named, and Sensibly structured files can also, um, it helps when you're preparing your data for analysis, uh, which is often a significant and, and time consuming step of the research process. And of course, the, these documenting practices are specific to the data and field. Here are a few, few pointers on this. So how to do it. First would be to develop a logical directory and folder structure. There is an example um, of a folder structure, which is very simple. Um, to the, the right. This separates ongoing and completed work and also schedule a time when you clean unnecessary files from folders. So file management, essentially. And using consistent file names, uh, file, file naming conventions, especially if you're working in a team, um, figure these out together and then stick to them. And use names that make sense to other people as well. Decide and agree on those elements. Uh, what do you need? Um, it might be the date, title, experiment name, creator, location, methods, uh, project identifiers if you have them, versions, and so forth. And then make an additional document that describes your naming conventions and structure of your folders and files. There is a, a supplementary document example there as well. Places where you can add this document information, um, you can include some in, in within the data files themselves, so variable names in the spreadsheet, uh, descriptive headers, for example, or descriptive information at the beginning of interviews. Uh, there's supplementary documentation uh, that can help you. Um, there are a few links there. 
a code book guidance for social behavioral and economic sciences by the DDI or DD initiative. And there's um, a readme file example from the Cornell University of how to um, create a very thorough readme file. And also if you're working with lab notebooks, um, the e-notebook other does that, uh, some tracking for you. And then to be mindful of the metadata standards, which would be the basic bibliographic information about data um, in data repositories or archives. Um, so title, creator, that sort of stuff. And then these are often specific to your discipline. So again, the, the DDI there being example, um, cultural heritage has their own metadata standards, same thing for the crystal graphic data. So these are general standards to describe the research activity, uh, identifying and describing your research outputs. So I'd recommend looking into the metadata standards within your field to ensure that um, the data that you create is interoperable. So it includes all the necessary information and it's in a format that is useful for other researchers. And then what does this look like in practice? Um, I have an example um, from interview data from a landscape architecture project on green planning. And for many, the, this will be very basic and sort of self-evident, but I'd like to, to look at this example from the point of view of if you were given this data set, uh, would you know what to do with it? So is the data provenance explained thoroughly enough? Uh, is there sufficient metadata? Is it reusable? And is it accessible data in a format that is easy to use? So this is um, from the FSD repository, and it is a data set, as I said, from um, interview data. So this is what it looks like when you download it. Um, you get the readme files straight out in front, and information in the, re uh, in the readme file would include the title of the project, the creator, the affiliations, uh, description of the data package, and an overview of the folders, it gives a suggested citation, uh, who to contact if there are problems, a bit about the methodology, location, dates, and, and formats as well, and these um, disclaimers on rights of use. So the first set of or first layer of information is there. If you go into the, the study itself, it has supplementary files, which give uh, details of where this research was done. Um, country, target area, um, date, uh, who collected it, uh, collection technique, what tools were used, um, and, and observations about the research. And also has an appendix which has the research questionnaire and the amount of material. And only after that, if you go further in, then you get to the data files. And you'll note that this was interview data, so these were audio files to begin with. But actually, in this case, when they are opening the file and giving it to others to ease um, accessibility, they have been all transcribed, these files. And when you open up a single data file, there's even a layer of metadata there. So when the interview was done um, and sort of details are where, when, uh, how long it lasted, that sort of stuff. And then, then you only get to the data itself. So there are layers there. And this is quite um, a nice example, or a very simple example of how this can be done well and, and thoroughly. Good. And then onwards to shoring, storing and sharing, um, which essentially you need somewhere that is safe and has enough space. Things to consider whilst you're figuring out where to store your data is that, is it being backed up? Who has access to your data? Is it safe and secure? And is it safe and secure if you need to share it as well? Does it allow sharing with um, researchers within your institution or, or those outside? And those questions about safety and access become even more important when you're working with private or sensitive data. Um, here, I also have a link to the other IT document. It outlines the security levels and storage options that we have available. For, um, for data or for research data storage. And this section I'm afraid is, is a bit uh, all the university heavy, but 
but I recommend looking into Istu's IT solutions and, and asking around. So what we offer um, researchers is the Alda Network Drive. This is large, secure, and it is backed up. It's the best place to, to save work um, or data in Alda. It is like folders on your computer, but more secure. You need an Alda account for it um, or VPN for and, and a VPN for remote access. You can get folders for your, re, uh, for your research group. And if you need more space, contact the uh, service desk. It is usable for personal and confidential data. If you're working, there's also the personal storage space option, uh, which isn't shared. You have departmental options as well, which um, allow sharing inside the department and also research groups if you're sharing uh, within a research group in all of them. There's also um, storage services for, for research data listed there from the link. And the cloud services that we have available um, are the Microsoft Teams, which works as a collaboration tool, as you all know, uh, for web meetings, file sharing. But the cloud options we have are Microsoft OneDrive, Google Drive, and Dropbox. Uh, it's easy sharing of non-confidential data. And we would recommend using an Aldo account because you get more, more storage space and more features that way. And there's also Edoni, which is an e-work and collaboration service environment, which is suitable for personal and confidential data. So as, a, as an example there, um, for example, if you're working with the interview data containing personal sensitive information or confidential data uh, obtained from a company, it can't be stored on or shouldn't be stored uh, and shared by the cloud services. And there, the solution is the, the other network drives. But then if you will have experimental data from a lab that can be stored and shared via cloud services. And these are questions where we have the, the IT services luckily on hand to advise and give um, further help with these. And then onwards towards publishing. So once your data is stored, uh, you've gathered it, stored it safely, and you might want to publish it in a, a data repository or archive. So the data in repositories are is available for everyone to reuse. And the owner of the data, i.e. you, research in this case, um, you get to decide how open you want your data to be. So once you have your data set ready, you decide if you want it to be open to all, if you would like it to be embargoed, if you want some um, or journal articles, for example, to be, be published uh, before you open it. And it could also be opened by request. As the owner of the data, you also decide what license to use. Um, for example, a CC license. Uh, CC BY is now compulsory for publicly um, funded research data uh, in data repositories. And this is in compliance with the Open Data Directive. But this does not um, concern software. Again, I would check the funder requirements for regard, uh, regarding licensing if you're opening up data. And as mentioned before, if you are working with personal, sensitive, or confidential data, consider carefully what can be opened. At all thought, the open science policy recommends that um, data be as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. And then the why of, of publishing your data, um, mainly that can be reused easily by others. Um, only published data is an independent research output, uh, much like a scientific article. And like an article, um, data sets receive a DOI number, a DOI um, number when they're published. So if you consider, or when you consider the, the published data as a research output, it makes sense to curate it um, carefully. And the data, data set, when you publish it, it should be clear, well-organized and a coherent whole that validates your research results and has everything needed to replicate the study and um, be in a forum that is useful for other researchers. So your data set, when you publish it, it could include measurement data, uh, both the raw and process data, uh, interview data, if it is anonymized, but it, also, it could also include software or your research protocols. A nice thing about publishing your data is that it can then be cited to give credit to, to um, the, the creators and other contributors. And it has a citation advantage. So your article gets more citations if the, the data linked to it is open. And there's also um, 
a link to a study about the citation advantage there. So if you're publishing in a journal that has a data availability statement, it is useful to add this information of the open data there, um, so it links to the, uh, the publication or your article to the data. And then finally, uh, typically funders require open data. And also these days, also some journals demand open data. So it's a bit of a stick and carrot in this case. And then where to uh, do this? Uh, there are quite a few repositories out there. The general repositories, they, these cover um, various types of data and research outputs. Uh, Zenodo being uh, quite a big one. This is EU-funded uh, long-term repository for any data, um, or medium-term, I guess. It's European, uh, covers mainly the measurement of computational data and code. But there's a wealth of, of research there. And there's also an Aldo video guide available for uploading data in Zenodo. And there's the UDAT services, again, European, and there's a guide to, to using this service. And then the Finnish National Fair Data Services, which um, are services to store, describe, and publish your data. And again, we have uh, further advice on using these. If you don't want to publish in a general repository, you might have specific uh, domain specific uh, repository that are planned for your uh, specific research type. So that could be the Cambridge repository for crystallographic data, uh, the FSD, uh, which we had some resources from them earlier on. And actually the, the interview data example that I showed was from yeah, the Finnish Social Science Data Archive. But great stuff there. And in case you're wondering uh, what would be the, the best option for you, you can go to um, catalog of repositories, um, RE3 data, where you're able to click through your the various um, subjects and topics and um, kind of find the repository options that are available to you or that might be useful to you. And then if you're wondering what that looks like in practice. Here are um, some examples of, of all the data sets that have been published in repositories. So you're able to go in, um, all of these are links. So we've got um, Research from the business school opened up in Zenodo, uh, some coding there as well. Um, of Zenodo, a bit of fair data and regard. So these are examples that you can go into um, once you have the, the, the slides. And then a part of this publishing is in all those cases, um, reporting it in the institutional research system. So ACRIS is the all the current research information system. Um, but many of your institutions probably have similar, similar systems in place. And in the case of all the way you ask research to send a link to the published data, this might be, for example, in Zenodo, uh, send this link to research data algo.fi, and that information of your data will be added to ARCOS. And there might be special cases. If um, you are not able to open your data, you might be open to to um, uh, saving the metadata or the description of, say, personal confidential data and uh, have that published in ARCOS. And this is a requirement in the Finnish Academy funded projects. So it is a way for you to fulfill your, your funding uh, funder requirements. And in ARCOS, you can ensure that your data is identified like your articles. Uh, it maximizes the visibility of your research work. It can be included in your CV. And also we were able to link um, the, the data to your article so, so people find, find your work more readily. And then last but not least, um, archiving your work. And this concerns the most significant and valuable research data. So, and this is, I'm talking about the long term, so decades or, or centuries sort of long um, archiving. And there is a section process uh, that for, for this sort of work uh, and a criteria. So the research data should be of scientific and or historical value and be very unique because this is uh, a service which requires um, digital preservation. So updating your files um, and maintaining them. So it's not for, not for all research. Um, for example, putting your, your research data in Zenodo, it will be there for years, but if it's a matter of something that requires your data to be available decades or centuries now, 
then um, the Finnish option for this is the National Service is the Long Term Preservation in Finland, um, it's the Fair Data uh, Pass, which is provided by CSC. And there is more information there on both uh, bus and digital preservation. And then lastly, I will um, talk up the options that we, more training that we have available. As mentioned, because this is such an, an introductory overview, we have uh, a lot of sessions that then go into more detail because these are multifaceted um, topics that do, do need it in some cases. So we have uh, themes for upcoming training, include the data management plans, um, in particular, Kathy is giving you that one, handling personal data, there's an introduction to GitHub, um, sharing research data through a repository, some hands-on um, examples there, uh, advice if you're working with restricted data sets, there's, just the, there's a training session on data anonymization, and also on the legal aspects of research data, information on how to store your research data, and uh, making your research and code reproducible and reusable. And then we also have a session on academic publishing, so Plan S and Overlay journals. And there, uh, there's further information on RDM um, guidance on our website, and also all of these trainings there. And for those who are at Alto, we also have data agents who are researchers or ex-researchers in, in their um, Sort of specific fields who advise on research data management at the departments. So these are people who raise awareness of RDM, um, help figure out where you can store your data safely, for example, uh, advise, give advice on where to publish your data, and promote open data and research management, and also give some advice on, on DMPs. And they do a weekly sort of Zoom um, open, open kind of a open uh, clinic where you are able to go and, and ask these questions and get, um, get support from someone who is in your field and, and knows the type of data that you're working with. And we also have uh, a general email address where we have data agents, um, IT experts, legal counselors, and information specialists to on hand help. And that was it from the presentation slide. Now we have about a few minutes for, for questions. 